Sometimes an atheist may say that there is no proof that God exists. How would you give him or her proof? If an atheist said to you, there's no proof that God exists. You can't prove that God exists. How would you respond to that? How would you prove to them that God exists? First, we would give them uh, good, give him uh, examples from the creation of God and prove it that it is the creation of God. Uh, give me an example. What do you mean? Mm. Uh, we could give him the example of creation of the universe and uh, show that it has to have a beginning and that beginning has to come from an uncreated beginning and that is God and that is the proof that God exists. Okay, um, if we're going to prove that God exists, uh, as we said, the most common proof used in the Quran is the design indicating designer. So this is the easiest one to work with, right? Somebody says, give me proof. Okay, You're, they, you say that since there is design, there must be a designer. And since everything in this world has design, there must be an overall designer for it. Okay, that is my proof. But they say to you, but that's still, you're not sure about it. Is that really proof? You're still only concluding. What are you going to say to that? And then we'll go on to the fact that nothing can come from nothing and everything has to have a beginning and that beginning has to come from something which was not itself I mean which is not the beginning I mean which was uh, which was uncreated and from there it starts in. okay I mean this is another argument for uh, the existence of the creator as as a logical proof but the point is that if somebody says to you after you showed them from design that there is a designer, as you concluded, then you ask them, prove to me that you exist. Prove to me that you exist. How do you prove that you exist? Huh? I can say that uh, you can see me, I'm sitting in front of you. Okay. You can see me, you, you can okay? See, yeah. So I said, By sight. that is inference. Because I can see you, you claim to exist. So that is inference, isn't it? You're inferring something. Because I can see you, you actually exist. But we see the sea as blue, right? The sea is blue. Is it actually blue? Is it actually blue? We see the sky as blue. Is the sky actually blue? Hmm? What do you think? All right. So, seeing is not necessarily believing. You understand? Where you can go with them. So the, the, the conclusion that you exist, in the end, it is from inference just like anything else that we believe in. Inference is involved. And it's not 100%. When we infer something, yes, if we're not 100% sure, that's what they say, you're still not 100% sure. You only believe it's reasonably sure. This is, well, that's what you're doing too. Even to prove your own existence, to prove anything, you're going to end up with inference. Okay? Okay, next question. We'll go on to the questions of the deists to save time from the brothers who haven't answered a question. 
Brothers who haven't answered a question, somebody please, quickly. Deists often say, I believe in God, but I don't believe in organized religion. How do you respond to such a statement? When he says, I don't believe in organized religion, uh, then I will ask him, do you believe in disorganized religion? Would you prefer? Would you prefer disorganized religion? Then I will see his uh, face, I mean, how he responds, and then I will give him the example of a company. Suppose in a company, if it's, it's not organized, if the company is not organized properly, then things will not move out, the, the, the effect of the product will not come well. So if it is organized, the effect of the product will, will reflect on the organization. So I would like to ask him whether the organization you prefer or you prefer disorganization. Good. So actually, when we say, would you prefer a disorganized religion, actually this is like a joke. Right? This is not really our response, but we do it just to get him to smile or get her to smile. And then you go into the concept of organization. That, as you said, everything in this world works better when it's organized. You recognize that in the whole of your life, from beginning to end. When it's organized, things go well. When it's disorganized, it doesn't go well. So now why, when everything you prefer organization, when it comes to religion, you don't want organization, right? So this is the point that we take them to. As it is needed everywhere else, religion is not something separate from the rest of us, you know? And really, this is a result of people taking religion as a personal thing. When you think of it as being my own personal choice, you know, it's my own spiritual inclinations. So naturally, you want to do it the way you want to do it. But really, religion is from God. That's really what the bottom line is. Uh, to the sisters. Uh, I, I had one but, why would, uh, but why would he say that uh, he prefers a disorganized religion? I mean, what is his he won't say, I prefer a disorganized religion. As I said, this is only a joke. You only say that to put a smile on their face. Why would he say? Why, huh? would, why, would why he wouldn't he say, I prefer a disorganized religion? Yeah, why would he want a disorganized religion? Then? He wouldn't. He doesn't. Okay. He understands once you said that would you prefer a disorganized religion? No, of course, no. No, he would say, no, no, I, prefer, I mean a religion of my own choice. And then you can go into it. From the sisters, somebody has the microphone? Quickly, please. Quickly, please. Okay, I'm just going to ask the question. If no sister is able, we'll just take a brother. If a deist told you that he or she did not believe in God, that God spoke to any human being, what would you say? If a deist told you that he or she did not believe in God, that God spoke to any human being, what would you say? Is your sister to answer that? Who hasn't answered before? Okay, brother, answer it, please. Who hasn't answered before? One of the brothers who hasn't answered before. Come on, just go. Uh, he spoke to Moses. A prophet, we believe that uh, God spoke to a prophet Moses. But this person says, I don't believe, believe in, then Mo in Moses. I don't believe he was a prophet. That's just a story. Stories people made up. We have Sai Baba who says that God spoke to him. I don't believe him either. Uh, um, Moses had a proof. Uh, Mo Moses had a proof. Yeah. He had, but, he, he had been given the commandments from Allah. But the atheist says, or the deist says, I don't believe he was given any commandments from God. He just made it up. Shall tell Ten you commandments, he just wrote those down, told people to do it. No, I'll tell him now. It's your choice then. <laughs> okay. How are you going to respond to that? Come. So I would say that... Uh, God communicated to humankind through the Quran. 
and uh, he would want to preserve it as it is that is why it's been uh, been as it is as it was revealed 14 for 14 centuries after it was revealed okay and also see, and no, also i would no, hold on hold on hold on you see mm. if you introduce the quran mm. he is you've opened the door for him to say but i don't believe in the quran so but if I, you say it hasn't been changed he says well i don't believe it hasn't been changed so, so you you're opening up too many other doors this is not this is not the clear and direct response so i'll show him the various uh, scientific proofs in quran which uh, scientists have found that's out that's the long way around uh, he made a claim he says i don't believe that god spoke to any human being you started off correctly could be you started off correctly go ahead Could sister like there was a factory owner and he had many people who worked for him and then they come up and say what work do we have to say and he says i don't know there'll be total chaos like the person who owns the owner he has to tell the people what to do so god has actually given us what he wants through the message right so i mean what you i mean you don't necessarily need to go to the example directly you make the statement first the statement why do we believe that god communicated to human beings because if his will if what he wanted from us was not communicated then nobody would find it or hardly anybody would know what to do in this world just as we give the example a factory or a school or whatever example we want to give where we see that information has to be conveyed so you don't believe why don't you believe that's what we need to go to why don't you believe because logic tells us god must have if you believe because remember we're dealing with a deist now not an atheist who says there's no god so the deist has accepted god's existence but that he communicated his will to human beings that's what he doesn't believe in so we show him logically he must have conveyed it so why don't you believe now what he commonly or she may commonly say after that is but there's so many religions how do i know which one the very fact that there's so many different religions and they all say that they are the right one how do how do i know it seems that people made it up How would you answer that? Same sister, how would you respond to that if that was their follow up? Sister, I'm sorry I didn't follow you. You gave the explanation that God logically had to co communicate his will to human beings. If the person comes back and then you ask them so why don't you believe that he communicated his his will to human beings since it's logical that he should have then their response is but there are so many different religions the world is filled with religions and they all claim that they are the right one can they all be the right one uh no they cannot there has to be one mm -hmm. and uh, we have to tell them that like this is the final re uh, revelation from us and uh, is that going to convince them like uh, there is only one god for us mm -hmm. and uh, there can only be one leader not many gods there'll be total confusion as to whom to believe mm, that's not going to answer their question because they already believe that there is a god and usually they'll believe that there is one god you know to answer that question we have to tell them we believe that islam is the one religion of god that doesn't mean you're going to believe in it so what you need to do is to look at the arguments of the different religions for their claiming to be the true religion if you want me to give you our arguments i can give them to you You know, you don't necessarily try to push it on them, but you say, you "No, know, but what you need to do if they all claim that they are the true religion, either they're all wrong, which is what you concluded, 
but we already showed you that God had to have conveyed his will so it means that one of them has to be right so how do you know which one is right investigate God gave you intelligence and a mind to investigate to look at the arguments we believe because of so and so and so and so if you want to know here's a book I can tell you and then look at the other religions see what their arguments are and then you have to come to a conclusion for yourself okay people are saying there is no time to investigate all those things I don't want to waste the time so how to uh, convince them with the next answer can we give directly the message of uh, uh, Islam directly well if we can't and you know, if they say that I don't have time to go to all the different religions, I say, well, okay, I'll give you the argument for Islam. And the true religion of God is a symbol presentation for the argument that Islam is the true religion of God. Just know those points. The name of the religion, the concept of God, universality of the religion, etc., etc. Just bring those points. Okay, um, we have to uh, go on. Actually, in your notes, for those of you that have the notes, there are further questions for deists. We don't have time to go through all of them. So, from here, we're going on now to Dawa to Christians. Dawa to Christians this is page 92 in the notes. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Regarding the creation being already in existence, can we tell them in short that if it was already in existence, there would be no reproduction and there would be no death? If there would be no reproduction and death, if it was already in existence, it would continue that way. Then there would be no reproduction and there would be no death. Mm, is that a conclusion, naturally? If... if uh, uh, the world already existed why would that prevent it from continuing to reproduce well, if, if it already existed it didn't uh, need to reproduce well, already there it would have continued that way and there was uh, no need of death but um, the fact that the world had a beginning is that proof that there is a need of death um, I don't know. I don't know if that is a logical argument necessarily. Okay, on to Dawa to Christians. The first uh, point to know, because again, listen before you speak. Having knowledge about whom you're speaking to is important. You're addressing Christians. Christianity is not a... Uh, consistent whole all members of Christianity holding the same belief in fact you'll find almost each Christian having his or her own belief don't be surprised at least you should know that there are two basic sects in mainstream Christianity Catholics and Protestants that Catholics are the oldest, the oldest uh, sect of Christianity are the Catholics, the Roman Catholics. From them came the Eastern Orthodox, the Greek and Russian Orthodox churches, which uh, split off from Roman Catholicism, but they basically share the same essential beliefs. What was Protestantism? Protestantism was a break with the structure of the church. The church, Roman Catholic Church, has a pope. It has bishops, cardinals, and a hierarchy. Protestantism is a break with that. It rejected the hierarchy of the church, as well as some of its beliefs. The hierarchy was rejected primarily by Martin Luther from the 15th century who had gone from Germany to uh, Rome 
on a spiritual pilgrimage. He had gone to Rome to experience uh, the holiness of Rome, the center of the church, to get blessings from the Holy Pope, right, who was the infallible uh, speaker of God's word on the earth, according to their... F when he got to Rome, what he found shocked him. He found the Pope sitting on a golden throne, wearing robes with golden thread, woven of golden thread, with a crown on his head with diamonds and emeralds and rubies, which was so heavy, he couldn't place it on his head. It had to be suspended from the roof by wires. He would only come and sit under him, under it, so people from a distance, it would appear to them that he was wearing the crown on his head. You know, holding, you know, a staff of gold and an orb of gold with a cross on it. That's how he sat. And this was the Pope. So of course he was shocked. The corruption that he saw there. Where was Jesus' simplicity and all the other things that were connected with Christianity as he had understood it? So what he did was, when he went back to Germany, he wrote a series of protests against the corruption in the church. And he pinned it on the wall of the church there in um, cathedral there in Germany. And so he and those who agreed with him came to be known as the Protestants or Protestants. They protested against the ex excesses of Roman Catholicism. They also rejected Mary, you know, as... A, an intermediary to whom you could pray because Catholics holding that Mary was the mother of God right? that's how she's that's her title Holy Mary mother of God so they pray to her as they pray through the Saints they have Saints for all occasions anything you need for marriage, for business, for anything. You're traveling, they're saints. So they pray to these saints. So the Protestants, they rejected this as additions. This was not what Jesus taught. And they restricted themselves to the worship of God through Jesus or the worship of Jesus. They restricted themselves to that. Also, some of the rites of the Roman Catholic Church, like communion. In communion, Roman Catholics believe that the priest, he carries little bits of bread and he brings a uh, mug of wine. And he tells them that in this rite, the bread is transformed into the body of Christ and the blood and the, the wine into the blood of Christ. So each person eats a piece of the bread, they drink the wine, consuming or absorbing into themselves the blood and the body of Christ. That is called communion. So the Protestants rejected this. They said, where did this come from? We don't accept this. And also, the... Uh, Roman Catholics, they used to perform all of their rites in Latin, right? So wherever they were, they were in France, they were wherever they were, the priests would always do the rites in Latin and the common people didn't understand what they were saying, they just, these things were done. The Protestants now allowed their prayers to be in other languages, they changed. Also, the Protestants rejected seven books from the Catholic Bible, which they referred to as the Apocrypha, the books of uncertain authenticity. They're doubtful books. So their Bible has seven books less than the Catholic Bible. 
So in fact, Christianity has two main Bibles. Actually, there are other sects who have made up their own versions, you know, as time went on. But as I said, when you're dealing with Christians, you need to know that basic information. So when somebody wants to argue with you from the Bible, as a means of, you know, shaking their position, you can say, well, which Bible are you going to use? The Catholic Bible or the Protestant Bible? They say, no, it's the same. No, it isn't the same. Right? They say, no. Actually, many, many Protestants don't even realize that they have two different Bibles. And same thing with Catholics. They don't realize that they're two different Bibles. So that alone can cause, put some doubt in their minds to open up their minds to accept some other, you know, thought and information. Anyway, after the Catholics and Protestants, you have four main, what we could call, or what they may call, deviant sects. Non-Christian non sects. But these sects call themselves Christians. Hmm? They're non-Christian, but, the, but uh, meaning that the main body of Christianity do not recognize them as Christian, but they call themselves Christian, like Qadianis for us. Qadianis call themselves Muslims, but we don't accept them as Muslims. Hmm? One of the big ones is the Mormons, very active. The Mormons, founded by Joseph Smith in the 19th century. He claimed to be a prophet of God. And that an angel by the name of Moroni came to him and taught him the Book of Mormon. This is their claim, right? Book of Mormon is written in English. Supposedly, he taught him in an angelic language. And he, it was originally written in golden tablets. And he needed a special cipher to uh, translate it into English. But the language is unknown. The cipher is nowhere to be found. All we have is the English writings of Joseph Smith. Anyway, what they are most known for in America is their unrestricted polygamy. The closest disciple of Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith had a number of wives, but his closest disciple, Brigham Young, he had 25 wives, right? And they continued to practice unrestricted polygamy until the U.S. government threatened them with taking away statehood from them. They are based in Utah, right? They, they are concentrated in Utah. Joseph Smith was murdered when he had gotten into a uh, fracas with some other people who opposed him for a political office. And some of his followers killed those people. And then people in the town killed him. So the main propagator was Brigham Young. That's why you have Brigham Young University, famous university in Utah State. Anyway, uh, they are governed by a council of elders. And what we find common in their religion is that whenever pressure comes on them, the council of elders gets revelation to relieve to release that pressure so when the government threatened them with the loss of statehood all of a sudden the elders got revelation that polygamy was to be cancelled abolished some of the followers said that's too convenient and they insisted to continue practicing polygamy so you have breakaway followers who continue to practice unrestricted polygamy till today Later on, when after the civil rights movement, uh, the Mormon church came under pressure because they, their teachings were that blacks could not enter the priesthood. 
priesthood was only for men when they reached 20 the priesthood of Melchizedek they call it but no blacks could enter that in 1978 they received revelation that blacks could now enter the priesthood you know this is how you see them changing right the point is we say to them your religion is not a stable religion was it right was it right for your prophet and his disciple Brigham Young and all of the others all the way up until 1978 to exclude blacks from the priesthood or not if it was right to include them then it must have been wrong to exclude them so they have uh, some beliefs among them that God is a huge man God is in fact a huge man looking just like us and that Adam who came to Eden was really God incarnate who came to Eden with one of his heavenly wives the next most active group are the Jehovah's Witness Jehovah's Witness their founder Charles Taze Russell you don't really hear too much of the main uh, developer of the group, Joseph Rutherford, he is the one who actually coined the name Jehovah's Witness. They were based on a sect which had appeared in the early 1800s where people were started to predict the end of the world they got into this calculation of the end of the world people went back into the Bible believing the Bible to be absolutely true they calculated from the time of Adam till that point that the world was going to end somewhere in the eight in the 1840s in 1843 they calculated that the world was going to end um, of course the world didn't end in 1843 because we're still around right and um, <clears throat> different groups that had originally come together were expecting the world to end actually the person who was calling for it was this individual by the name of William Miller so their followers they came to be known as Millerites uh, they split up some of them went back to regular Christianity others formed their own sects the Jehovah's Witness is one of the products of that era. And what you found is that the founder, Charles Taze Russell, he made a series of predictions. He first predicted that the world was going to end in 1914. Then in 1918, when it didn't happen in 1914, he, he said it would die, end in 1918. And um, he died in 1916, so that was convenient. Hmm? then when it didn't end in 1918 the next uh, founder which is Joseph Rutherford he claimed it would end in 1920 then 1925 the 1941 the 1975 and he died before 1975 in fact he died in 1942 so what happened is in 1975 after these people had been embarrassed so many times they eventually said that they had made a miscalculation they were calculating from the time of Adam's creation when they should have been calculating from the time of Eve's creation which they weren't sure about so therefore they're not certain exactly when the world's gonna end so they ended that um, among their strange beliefs is that souls are not separate from the body just one being this is not a soul and a body it's one 
Jesus is not God. It's important because you might think talking to them as Christians that they believe that Jesus was God. They believe he was the created son of God. Also the Mormons don't believe that Jesus was the son of God. You know, they have a belief that he was also created. They, the Jehovah's Witness don't believe in hell. Right? And their basic claim is that they have the name of God, Jehovah. When they give their dawah to other Christians, they go up to Catholics and other Protestants, etc. They will usually ask them, do you know the name of God? And the average Christian says, his name's God. They say, no, no, no. God is not the name of God. God refers to the position or the office. That's not his name. What is the name of God? The average Christian is stumped. So then they tell them the name of God is Jehovah. That is their big, you know, difference that they use to enlighten the other Christians to draw them into their following. However, if, we, if they bring that to us, we ask them, where is Jehovah found in the King James Version of the Bible? Now, don't ask them in the Bible because they have their own Bible called the New World Bible in which they've written Jehovah in all over the place. Okay? Only in their Bible. Right? So don't ask them in the Bible because they will show you that. Say no. In the King James Version of the Bible. Where is the name Jehovah? It's nowhere to be found. In fact, the Jews do not have that name. This name was made up much later on. It was not a name known even to the Jews. They had in their Torah three letters. The Ya, the Ha, and the Wow. That's what they had. And they did not say the name of God. It was forbidden for them to say the name of God. This, this name, or this, these letters only indicated God. They wouldn't say the name. Instead, they would say Adonai, which means the Lord. Right? It was forbidden, considered to be sacrilegious to say the name of God. So what happened is that much later on, somewhere around the 12th or 13th century, somebody combined the letters, the vowels from Adonai with the letters of Yaha, Wow, and Ha. Sorry, there are four letters. And together they ended up with Yahweh. And from Yahweh, they went into English as Jehovah. Right? So it is a non-existent word. It's a word that they made up. So we can pin them from that point. The other major group is called the Seven Days Adventists. Their founder, a leading prophet, prophetess, Ellen White, she was also one of the followers of the Millerites. She's one of the Millerites. And she claimed to receive revelation. They have their own little book of revelation. And they are similar to Muslims in that they, were, they don't eat pork, don't smoke alcohol, of course. Sorry, don't drink alcohol. They don't smoke tobacco. You know, most Muslims or many Muslims are smoking tobacco, which they shouldn't be doing because it's haram. But they don't smoke. In fact, their women don't wear makeup. You know, they're heavy into modesty and these kind of things. So there's, there's similarity in terms of their conservatism, you know, to uh, Muslim practices. For them, they worship on the seventh day, the Sabbath. That's why they're called the seventh day Adventists and 
one of their leading followers who broke away in around the 60s or late 50s, he wrote a book called The White Lie. The White Lie. This is uh, referring back to their founding prophetess, Ellen White. Her name was Ellen White. So he wrote a book called The White Lie, in which he brought a series of texts that she plagiarized to make up her little book of revelation. That's why he called it the white lie. And a number of their followers have broken away and written against the sect. So if you have to deal with them, if you're in contact with them, you can uh, do research, further research into their, uh, those people who have refuted them to uh, help them find the truth. The last major group that we should look at are known as the born again Christians and these are the most active amongst the mainstream Christians, Catholics and Protestants, the born agains. Basically their belief is that you can't be a true Christian unless you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Actually this idea preceded them in the early 1900s you had a group which were known as the Pentecostals and they had stressed this idea of being overcome by the Holy Spirit. Pentecostals continue till today. They have different Pentecostal groups in the States. Um, they are characterized by prayer meetings in which the people jump up and down and then they eventually fall on the ground and they start speaking in tongues. They call it speaking in tongues. They blabber and say things. They say it's in different languages and stuff, but most of it is not in different languages at all. It seems some of them have become overcome by the jinn, but they think that somehow they're being covered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has entered into them. So the born-again Christians basically argue that you cannot be a true Christian unless you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. This is their basic uh, belief and they hold that the Bible is 100% the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God of course Christian scholarship not Muslim scholarship but Christian scholarship from Protestants to Catholics to others have demonstrated that the Bible is in fact not the Word of God from Genesis to Revelations. There are much contradictions in the Bible. There are many things which are obviously not written by the people who they are ascribed to, like the case of Moses, uh, where it's written there that Moses when he died he was buried in such and such a place and the people did this and they did that and this is in one of the books of Moses could Moses have written that no and there are many things like this many contradictions like this which exist which Christian scholars concluded that it was not in fact the Word of God there is Word of God there but human beings have added subtracted etc and all you have to do is to compare a King James version of the Bible with a modern standard version of the Bible, the revised standard version of the Bible. And you will see in the footnotes of the revised standard version of the Bible, many verses, chapters and sections which are deleted from the Bible with a note saying that these were not found in the early manuscripts of the Bible. So, uh, the argument of the born-agains is very weak. However, for born-agains, they are among the closest to Islam in that they have read the Bible. So, you can bring issues to them from the Bible. The average Catholic and Protestant never reads the Bible. All he knows of Christianity is whatever the priest or the minister tells him on Sunday. 
and they keep repeating the same things over and over again they only pick just a few verses from the bible and they just use this as the basis of the sermons regularly the average christian especially the catholics are advised not to read the bible because it will confuse you and truly a person who sits down and reads the bible will come out confused because what he sees in front of him of christianity will not conform with what he read in the bible and that's why they don't encourage them to read better you depend on the interpretation of the minister or the priest however for mainstream christians the trinity is the unifying belief the trinity god the father god the son and god the holy ghost or the holy spirit three gods in one the point to mention to those who are more educated is that this belief appeared in the fourth century it was not the uniform belief of christians prior to the fourth century in 325 a.d or ce in the year of christian era in 325 in nicaea in southern what is now southern turkey a council of bishops was held and a vote was taken for those who supported trinity and those who supported unity the majority of bishops came from greece and rome minority came from palestine syria egypt and the minor minority lost constantine had just converted to christianity roman christianity and he put his support the armies of the roman empire was put behind the bishops of greece and rome and those who held that god was one and jesus was not god but was a prophet of god they became labeled as heretics the leader of those who held that position in that council was arius the presbyter of alexandria in egypt so those who hold that belief were called arians based from arius and it's called the arian heresy the arian heresy hmm? <clears throat> now for those who are educated we said studying the history of christianity is enlightening because most of them have not they don't know the history so bringing out some points of history can open them up to reflect and to study further and to get clarity about the reality of Christi christianity for others or before we say that we can sum up the trinitarian concept the essence of it what it means in practical term when you say god the father god the son and god the holy spirit what you're saying is that god bore a son who was himself and he allowed himself to be sacrificed to himself to free humankind from their sins Right? This is the essence of Christian belief. God bore a son. God had a son. Who was himself. God the Father, God the Son. Who allowed himself to be sacrificed on the cross to himself. He sacrificed himself to himself. To free humankind from their sins that is the sum of their belief now when you are dealing with a simple christian who is not highly educated and into philosophy remember i told you 
we have a simple approach, which is the A equals B. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Straight logic. Can you be God? No. Was Jesus a man? Yes. Therefore, Jesus could not be God. Because you couldn't be God. Why? Because you're a man. Jesus was a man. Therefore, Jesus couldn't be God. Very simple. For a lot of Christians, that's enough if they're open-minded, simple. That's enough to conclude that yes, I hadn't really thought about it. Jesus couldn't possibly have been God. <clears throat> For others, we can use what is called the baby God concept. Baby God concept. You believe in one God. However, we know that cats have kittens. When a cat has a kitten, you have what? A little cat. When cows have calves, you have little cows. When human beings have children, you have little human beings. So when God has a child, what do you have? A baby God. So you have the main God and a baby God. You know, it's again, for some people, that's a wake-up call. You can use that kind of logic. Some people, they say that Jesus was the Son of God, but He was not really God. He was the Son of God. You'll find even Catholics saying this. He was the Son of God, but He, was, he wasn't really God. He was the Son of God. Because the idea of Him being God becomes complex and problematic. But for Catholics, we only have to say to them, what is the title that you give to Mary? Hail Mary, Mother of God. That is the title. They say this. this is one of their novenas, one of their uh, vicars that they make. Hail Mary, Mother of God, the Lord is with thee. So say, you call her the Mother of God. So what does that make Jesus? But God. Okay, so you bring him back to the problem of Jesus being God. The main point for the majority of Christians is to distinguish for them between Jesus and God. To clarify for them that Jesus couldn't have been God even according to your own uh, beliefs and teachings. And I should mention that the first logical argument I gave you about A equals B and B equals C, therefore A must equal C, that for the Christian, 